Hello, everybody, and welcome to Whispers Radio here on AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog, and UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is 6.07 p.m., 46 degrees out, and rainy. I'm Jordan Klein. He's Nick Queen. The other he's Brandon Palmer, and the other other he stepping in for uh, the lovely Lola Miller is Biff Leonard. How you doing, Biff? Good. How are you guys? Yeah, he's still lovely, though. Yes, he's still the lovely Biff Leonard. The right? lovely Biff? Yeah. I, I don't want to get beat up. He, <laughs> kind of a, uh, this is kind of a rare occurrence here. Uh, been a while since since I've been on, so uh, it's it's always good to to come on and uh, ready to go. Yeah, we haven't had you on. It's It's been a while. It has been a while. He was here for the unspeakable incident. <laughs> That's, I, I'm the not one, sure. One of many? <laughs> <laughs> Which one was that? The, the worst one. <laughs> if yeah, you didn't well. watch that sh- or catch that show, it's online, but you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> just, just scale through all of them that say Biff. You'll, you'll, yeah. <laughs> you'll get it. <laughs> Give us a call, 304-214-1600. If you're out of the area, 1-866-514-1600. We got a call, Biff? We've got Barb. Hey, Barb. Hey guys, how's it going? Okay, awesome. how are you, Mark? Bad. I was gonna stop in tonight, but um, I couldn't. My knee's too bad. But I have a recording. Are you there? Yep. Yeah, we're here. Okay, I couldn't hear. I have a recording that I need you guys to like go through because there's some really neat stuff in it. Oh yeah, what kind of recording? Um, it was it taken at my son's house. And you, his house abuts a graveyard. I mean, it's like his back fence is right there. And it's a child's voice. Really? What's the child and saying? Mommy. Oh, it's oh, yelling, creepy. mommy, mommy. It's, it's creepy. yelling, mommy. Now, does your son have kids? Yes, but they weren't. They were sleeping, and, and they weren't and, in the backyard. Like lost. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. no, because when he he played it for me, I was like, okay, where were the kids? What was going on? The whole bit. And I was going to bring it up tonight, but my knee went out. So next week. If you guys have something, you can refine it. and. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, as long as we can take your recorder in for a week. Yeah. Oh, no, no. You can. No. He, he said that's fine. So I'll be bringing it in next week then if I can walk. <laughs> awesome. You're going to let us play it on the air? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Plus, there's other things in there, too. And he that's the most significant. But he needs to go through it. And he's going to mark, um, like, the times or the numbers. All right. Where where you really need to listen to, okay? Now, is it the only just one incident on that recorder, or is it? No, no. There's several. It's different days. Okay. Different dates, different times. But that's all on this. It's a, like a little digital recorder thing. Oh wow. And it'll it'll show you exactly what days and all that stuff. You guys are just going to have to refine it and take out the background. But you can. It's this child says mommy. And then a few seconds later, it's mommy. It's really, really weird. Now, how big is the graveyard behind his house? Um, I'm not sure how big is that graveyard. There's seven graves that you can see. But there's 72 or 75 people there. The gravestones have just been all removed. Oh, wow. Now, so, of, of the seven graves that are there, is there any uh, child's graves? Are there children's graves of the ones that are there? Three. Oh, Three wow. kids. Wow. Yeah, so it should be wow. really cool. So I'll bring it in next week, and I'll wear my Mothman T-shirt. And oh, awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, thanks, Barb. <laughs> All right, guys. Have right, a good show. Ya. Bye. Thanks. That's neat. That is crazy. Well, and that is that kicks off October. So, I mean, October, is, as you always say, is our scary month. What? We have a scary month? We do. I don't know if that's the, the <laughs> official title. I do. I do want to throw out that uh, it is uh, Fire Safety Week. Is it that is. right, Brandon? It is Fire Safety Scary. Week this week. Bra- Brandon and I, with some of our uh, firefighter buddies, went and did uh, the fire safety at Middle Creek Elementary yesterday. It was very fun. Very fun. And uh, we want to remind all of you, change the batteries in your smoke detectors. And they're only good for 10 years. The smoke detectors, not yes. the batteries. <laughs> the smoke detectors are any good for 10 yeah. years. And have your pets spayed or neutered. <laughs> have your pets spayed or neutered. <laughs> All right, Nikki, you want to introduce our guest? Well, before we do that, just real quick, yep. you want to end of the month? What's happening? Oh, on? October 26th, we have our third annual call-in Halloween Ghost story. Ghost story extravaganza yeah. show. Giveaway show. We really need to work on that title. Yeah, yeah. We, need, we need to write something down, but that, uh, 
October 26th, get your stories ready because we're going to have call-ins. And then everybody that calls in gets a prize. Woo! Yay! <laughs> and, of course, if you're out there, you want to give away a prize. Oh, yeah. Get a hold of us, and yeah. uh, we'll give away your stuff. Yep. <laughs> uh, for those of you that are, are, are out of town, that aren't in our uh, our city, Nick, books? We should have a pretty good bit of book, books. i got to stack them up and count them and see what we got. So. Okay, so we're going to have books to give away. So if you're out of town, don't worry about it. we got books for you. All right, now introduce our guest. Now introduce. All right, <laughs> Leslie Keene is an investigative reporter. He spent the last 10 years studying the still unexplained UFO phenomenon. Uh, review, uh, she reviewed hundreds of uh, government documents, aviation reports, radar data, case studies, uh, and examined, uh, scientifically analyzed photographs and interviewed dozens of high-level officials. Uh, her new book uh, is UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. Uh, Leslie, you with us? Hi, it's great to be with you. Hi, Leslie. Hi there. So uh, tell us how you did all this research for this book. Well, how I did it, well, I could go back uh, back to 1999, which is when it all started. And, and um, it started when I received the Cometa report in the mail, which is a French study put together by retired French officials. Okay. And, you know, we can talk more about that if you want. And then, you know, as sure. a journalist, I just began looking into the subject and, and published a series of stories on it. And, uh, you know, over the years and got more and more interested in it, just kept digging into it more and more and eventually got, you know, made contacts with people at high levels. And it was sort of a progression, you know, towards learning more and getting more data and more contacts and more evidence and more kind of journalistically sound information, which is what I'm interested in. And then it kind of all culminated in this book that you just mentioned, um, which is really kind of a culmination of 10 years of work. So wow. that's sort of the story in a nutshell. We can go into any more details. Right, if well, you Nick want has to. a question. Well, you, you know, bef before we get into this, you know, I want to kind of get a little bit of your background because uh, I've really, I couldn't wait to get the book, book and I, I haven't even touched, I mean, it's so much stuff. But, you know, you yourself, you weren't into UFOs and. And I want to say, you know, you're not a UFO nut, nut, but you mean you really weren't into this before before you received that report, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I was certainly curious about it, and I had read a few books about UFOs over the years. You know, I would read a book that would come out, and then, and then I would forget about it for three years, and then I'd pick up another book. It was that yeah. kind of thing. It wasn't yeah. like any kind of major... Like a curiosity, but not... Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if a best-selling book comes out, I might read it. Like, I'd read a lot of other books. Yeah. Now, what so, was your um, opinion of UFOs at that time? I mean... I didn't really have one. I mean, I was definitely... You know, I, I, I certainly didn't, I, you know, write off anything that I read. I mean, I was very curious about it, and I thought the books were fascinating. And, I, you know, it, it certainly touched um, a sense of mystery and awe in me, but I, I didn't know a whole lot about it. You know, and it was more just sort of curious and found it really fascinating. And, and certainly open to the reality of it for sure. Sure. And then you know it was just like I never it would have imagined that I ever would have become professionally interested in it. And it was really because of this French study that you know it, as a journalist I, mean, I was looking at that through a journalist's eyes, and that's the way I've always looked at the subject. I'm not sort of you know as you say a UFO believer, you know buff or kind of you know, enthusiast. I mean, I've always stayed on the side of being a journalist on this, and yeah. I think that's one of the reasons the book is, is sort of different, is because it's written by a journalist with a track record and there's a certain perspective and approach that you take when you're coming from that angle. Um, and I've always stayed with that, so... And that's uh, what, you know, I was going to say, you know, reading the book itself, it seems kind of, uh, you know, unbiased, a very... As, bu as unbiased as you can be, of course, you know, we all, all have biases, but very analyt analytic and going at it more, it has a different tone to it than a lot of the books I've read on the subject. Uh, yeah, which, and which I, I really, like it's refreshing for well, the, good, know, and I hope I hope so. And you know, I don't. I, it's not analytic. I don't think it's heavy-handed or difficult sure. to read or anything. But you know, I've always sort of had this more detached um, relationship to it, which is really about you know doing my job as a journalist, which is finding information that can be corroborated and documented, and you know comes from really credible sources. And kind of pulling it all together and asking, well, what does this mean? And really clarifying, what do we actually know about UFOs? What are the actual facts as opposed to the speculations that we have? And I just thought it was really important to sort that out with the absolute best possible information being provided to people so that we can really try to change the kind of taboo attitudes that are out there towards the subject. 
Well, now, you know, going into the and uh, uh, the Camerata report itself, you know, what about it struck you as different than anything else that you had read pr- up to that point? Okay, like, yeah, I love talking about this report because it completely changed my life. And what was different about it, well, first of all, it was a, a group of very high-level officials all from one country, and it included four generals, one of them a four-star general, and it included an admiral, and it included the former head of the whole National Space Agency in France. Um, so, you know, they were really impressive people, and what they did was they, they spent three years looking at official UFO data from around the world, and they were very interested in it from a military perspective, and they were asking questions about defense and preparedness, you know, and national security, and those kinds of questions as they pertain to the UFO phenomenon. And I think, you know, what got me when I, as a journalist, when I got this report in the mail, I got one of the early English translations of it, was, first of all, the case studies, the cases they presented were fascinating and incredible. But their conclusion what was really was what really floored me, because, again, you've got to remember who these people are. And the conclusion they drew to this report was that the cases that they looked into, they, they said that they thought the extraterrestrial hypothesis was the most valid, the most rational, and the most likely explanation by far for these very excellent cases that they had studied, which, again, is a small percentage of cases that are out there, but nonetheless, I, you know, for generals to make a statement like that, and when you think about its implications, yeah. you know, that's, that's what really got me as a journalist when I read those conclusions, and I thought, oh, my God, this is a big story, you know? Imagine if generals in the United States said something like that. So that was sort of... You know, and then I've always sort of stayed focused on who are the highest level officials and what do they have to say. And it was really that report that got me started. And that's sort of, so that way you can see why, you know, you just sort of, as a journalist, I, I just sort of got that this is a big story. And it was that report that really opened my eyes to that. Now, going into this, I mean, I know the U.S., you know, it, of course, we're all here in the you know, United States. Do, do you see us as, you know, kind of a head? Uh, ahead or behind other countries as it goes to uh you know goes toward maybe disclosure or or even talking about this at all you mean uh, government official military wise yeah i mean i would have to say i see us as behind other countries and that certainly is one of the themes of the book um that, that sort of weaves throughout it is to compare united states government responses to the phenomenon to other countries and, it's, it, it, you know, I, I look at that continuously, and, in fact, um, you know, one of the points I just want to make quickly about the book is that these officials, these generals, government, and, government officials and pilots that I refer to in the title actually have written their own pieces for the book. It's not just me quoting them. It's them actually writing their own chapters. Wow. Yeah, and one of the things I did was I got the people who are, ahead, who are heads of some of these agencies in other countries to write chapters for us about what they do. And the, the difference being with America is, that these other countries actually have official agencies that do nothing. Their their sole purpose is to investigate UFOs and to investigate especially aviation safety and military cases. So the the difference is very striking between the United States. And, you know, of course, I'm not talking about every country in the world, but I'm talking about a number of countries in Europe and a number of countries in South America. And we all know about other countries, too, that have... uh, you know, are much more open than we are about it. But those are countries that I focused on because they actually have these these government agencies. So um, I think it's it's really important. And to compare not only the fact that these agencies exist, not only the fact that other countries have released a lot more files than we have, but also when events happen, such as we could, as an example, the O'Hare case of 2006, uh-huh. these other governments will properly investigate them and make the information public. And that's one of the striking differences. You know, we all know how the U.S. government reacts when an event happens, as as compared to other countries who do proper and responsible investigations and actually tell people what they learned. Okay, uh, let, let me ask you this now. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're asking all these other countries now. Do you believe? Well, I don't want to say do you believe. I want to say, could there be? I guess the U.S. hasn't disclosed that because the U.S. those are actually U.S. ships. Those are U.S. aircrafts going into, like, South America or over, you said, in Europe. Now, could, 
is the is there a possibility that they could be ours and that's why we're not like oh yeah we've seen them too you know yeah i mean i think it's a really good question and you know i can't answer that a hundred percent but my sense is from people that i've talked to well first of all i'm pretty clear that that couldn't explain away all the cases okay, okay. even if some of them are are some kind of advanced technology that's being tested or is being kept secret the experts that I've talked to, and, you know, they, they all tell me that, you know, the kinds of technology that's being demonstrated by these things, that they just say it's impossible that we could have that technology. Now, I'm not an expert on that. I just have to rely on what other people tell me. But some of the behaviors of these things are so phenomenal. And one of them was, you know, for instance, the Belgian wave. I mean, Major General de Brouwer, who is a sophisticated guy and has contacts in high levels all okay. over the world, believes that absolutely, it's absolutely impossible that anybody on this planet could have the technology that he that was demonstrated in the Belgian wave of the early 90s. So, you know, I don't know. I just have never heard anybody um, say otherwise than that, the people that I've spoken to. But, again, and I think it's important to realize, too, that w what we're talking about here is only 5% of all sightings, because most sightings, as we all know, can be explained. And we're talking about this 5% of very well-investigated cases that don't seem to have any other explanation. I, I, I assume it, it's possible that some of those cases are technology, but I just have, am convinced it couldn't explain all of them, and I'm, especially the ones that took place many years ago. Well, now let's so, talk, we don't know 100%, of course, though. Well, let's talk a little bit about this Belgian wave. For, you know, for those that don't, you know, I'm, like, I'm kind of looking through the book, too, looking at some of the drawings that people have made of it. For those that don't know about the Belgian wave, can you kind of just give a just a brief uh, rundown of what exactly happened? And, uh, sure. I mean, the, the brief rundown is that in starting in November of '89, it lasted about a year and a half in Bel over Belgium. There were just these repeated sightings of these triangular craft that mm -hmm. had, you know, big spotlights, one in each corner, and then a central spotlight. That was the okay, most. Okay, you were showing me those pictures right before. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, in the book, we have the major general who wrote the piece about it, actually, and again, he was the lead investigator for the Air Force. He provided numerous drawings that witnesses made throughout the book, and we also, there was a spectacular photograph also taken of one of them, which is one of these UFOs, which is in the book as well, and has been very well investigated and analyzed. So, I mean, that's really the nutshell, is that these things just kept coming back and back and back, and so many people saw them, including many police officers. Um, and what's interesting about it is that the government did a very good job of, of in trying to figure out what they were and trying to investigate mm -hmm. and really uh, did their darndest to find out what these things were. And they made everything public. So it's, it's sort of an interesting contrast. Do you, do you mean that. that they made everything public and there wasn't widespread panic and exactly. complete anarchy? I know. I mean, I that's just don't the believe thing. That. <laughs> it's such a good point. Yeah, it's and you know all they're saying is they don't know what the things were. They're not saying oh there's some kind of alien spacecraft because we don't know that. They're just saying well here's what we observed and we haven't been able to explain them. Period. Yeah. And I don't think that causes widespread panic. Do you think? Okay, let's say they had, they came out and said, you know, oh my God, it's from another you know another world, another planet. Do you think at that point? Maybe they would. I mean, your I personal opinion, of course. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah, speculation. I mean, yeah. if they had absolute definitive proof, which I, I don't know how they would get that. It might it mean they actually obtained a craft or they, yeah. who knows, let's say, but there was some dramatic landing or so let's say somehow they had 100% proof. Yeah. I mean, of course, that's a very different ball game than saying we don't know what they were. But um, I, I just, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that so many people already kind of are convinced that we're being visited. I mean, mm -hmm. they've done polls on it. You know, many, many people, have, and many other cultures, it's not that strange to them. It's part of their culture. So it may be that we're overestimating the, the intensity, that you know, the, the impact that that kind of an announcement could have. But on the other hand, I don't know. I mean, I know Richard Dolan's got a new book coming out where he's explored that, and some people think it will be a major, major upheaval for the for the planet when that happens if it happens so it's all it's, it's a matter of speculation i mean i don't really know i'm curious what what you guys might think or what other people might think but yeah, i mean certainly we've had plenty of announcements that there is an unexplained phenomenon you know coming and visiting a country over and over again i think most people probably think about that as being very likely extraterrestrial and they haven't it hasn't caused any upheavals so I think if we can just inch there, maybe if we get there more closely and get there more gradually, 
then if we do get that kind of proof, maybe it won't be as much of a shock if we can at least start off by, by the, the American government at least some kind announcing of acceptance. that there's something unknown. Yeah. Right? I mean, that would be one step towards acclimating people. And, um, you know, and maybe, it, maybe then – so we need to just start – we need to start with step one, which is just to acknowledge when an event happens and not pretend it's something that it's not. That would be a good step in the right direction, I think. Well, do you? I mean, and you know, you're part of the uh, you know the media itself uh, to some degree, and and I know a lot of times it seems like you know I'll go out, I'm looking for a story, you know, to, uh, to talk about maybe on the show. I'll find something, and and I won't name any because it seems like it's almost a universal. I'll find a story on you know on the web, goes to a newspaper, TV, uh, you know, whatever. And it always seems like there's this tongue-in-cheek kind of, you know, just just response. I mean, it's, sometimes it's not even just right out there, but it's you can just tell right. right there. You know, it's oh, you know, somebody saw you a UFO, and it's and it's almost like they're kind of just Making gently fun of it. mocking it, kind of like it's always under news of the weird or you exactly. know exactly and. Or or they use the phrase "little green men," right? Oh yeah, you know, and it's uh, or they'll put it in parentheses, you know. They just have to throw something in there that sort of is 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 kind of has a jokey tone to it. Yeah, and do you think that's part of, you know, how did that get into the media itself? I mean, because that's a you know part of the problem is nobody wants to come out and get mocked. I mean, it's like, is there an unwritten law for you journalists that you know you don't want to commit like a journalistic suicide by you know actually talking about ufos and you gotta hide your beliefs and in, in mockery like i, I don't is yeah that i mean <laughs> i think it's for a lot of journalists certainly feel that way i mean i never felt that way but i was sort of on the progressive side of things anyway and you know i was i found this to be really fascinating in fact when i published my first story on this in the boston globe the editor there wanted to do that i mean i think you know and i i just fought it but I, I think it's a very, yeah, like you say, an unwritten law. It's kind of an innate reaction that most journalists have. They sort of want to protect themselves by letting you, the reader or the listener, know that they don't really take these things completely seriously. Yeah. Or you're going to think something's wrong with them if they yeah. act like they do. And I think it's just this, this and they're all sort of programmed. It's been going on for so long, and it's such a, it's sort of been integrated into the culture and into the media that that's how you approach it. But I also think, on the other hand, the media is getting better, and we've had a lot of coverage, you know, more recently that's been very fair and very serious. I think um, so. I hope we're moving away from that, but it's a very, it's a very serious big problem i i certainly agree with you yeah and i i know i've been uh, watching the you know the national press uh, uh, club press conference for the ufo uh, uh where they're talking about uh, these generals that came out that were talking about you know ufos over you know the u.s's uh nuclear bases mm -hmm. and you know and I, I found it more interesting I, i've heard that story you know afterward you would have these news CNN articles coming too, back yeah. Is on CNN and everything, but the news articles coming out of it, you know, the UFO community sitting here every time a new one came out, oh, well, this person kind of mocks it, but a lot of them didn't mock it, and it was, you know, and they were, well, that's actually, you know, a fair coverage of it. And, I and, agree with you. I thought there this, was some really yeah. good coverage of that. There was some that wasn't so good, but I also think that the people at the press conference left themselves open for possible, you know, ridicule just because of certain things they said, mm -hmm. which were sort of about the, you know, saying that the the uh, the aliens are here with the intention of trying to give us a message about nuclear weapons, and um, you know that I remember with the CNN piece that was the one that one sentence was what they focused on, and then they did this sort of jokey, you yeah. know, real put downy show, which was really awful. Um, so I think it's, the lesson from that is to be, you know, for people to be very careful about what they actually say. And if they hadn't talked about that kind of thing, which is really a speculative, I don't think there would have been any ridicule. So I think you can be very, very careful and, and really minimize it. Um, and I, I was really pleased with, with overall with the response to the press conference on Monday. I think, um, you know, it's a serious topic and it got some serious coverage. Uh, we got a question from the chat room. New York Lily says uh, or asks, uh, "Did anyone you interviewed for your book show indication of abduction or contact, either a military abduction or alien?" 
Um, no, I, actually, that's a good question, and I have to say no. Um, you know, there there certainly were some witnesses who may feel like all their questions haven't been answered about what happened to them, but nothing really specific. Because I'm familiar with the the sort of the scenario of how the abductions happen. Nothing, you know, no big no reports of missing time. Although there were some reports, Jim Peniston is one person from the. Um, case the Rendlesham Forest case in the UK who has some questions about what maybe happened to him during this long interval where he was examining the craft so there are people that you know, there are witnesses that still have some questions but I wouldn't say any no none of them talked about contact or abductions to give you a, a very direct answer no they didn't hmm. now do you because that seems always to be a big part of the actual you know a lot of people's stories for the uh, for UFOs I mean, was that something that you were also looking for, or did you was your focus just on the actual response of of you know the governments and military towards the UFOs themselves? Yeah, I mean, the, the focus really was on trying to document the physical reality of the UFO physical object in the sky, because um, you know I think there is so much evidence for that that I, I really wanted to just make a case that it was absolutely certain that the, that these things exist. Mm -hmm. That was really the purpose of it. And, you know, if the, the, there are some very strong cases that involve a lot of paranormal and contact and abduction-type scenarios, and I didn't want to include them because the purpose of this book is really to try to reach, you know, the status quo, the politicians, the scientists, the people who are so close to this subject matter that they're not going to be able to accept that kind of aspect of it. So I'm sort of starting with square one, which is let's just show them that there are objects in the sky because this can really be proven mm -hmm. through documents and through the the reports of high level people. And once we get once we get the status quo to accept that, then I think we can move forward with some of the more the other aspects of the phenomenon. But I think we have to start with the very basic stuff. So it was sort of a strategic choice on my part to focus on certain kinds of information that I thought, let's say a member of Congress or a, a congressional staffer would be comfortable with. They wouldn't have to feel uncomfortable reading, you know, a, a government document or a general's chapter in a book. But they might be uncomfortable with a story about abductions or some of the more, quotes, weirder parts of the phenomenon. So in order to break through, I think you've got to really stick with the sort of hardcore official information. And that was that's the strategy behind the book. Now, do you... Do you ever, or did you ever run into any uh, investigations by the military, you, uh, the government, towards uh, you know abductions themselves? So your actual documented, you know, what's happening to our citizens, kind of thing, uh, or was it always uh, talking more about the potential of these crafts uh, to cause problems inside the country, uh, maybe, you know, military kind of uh, clashes or something that might come out of it. Yeah, I mean, it really was the latter thing, you know, national security questions mm -hmm. and questions about, you know, when something lands. And, I mean, the, you know, the, the f officials are very concerned with aviation safety issues. You know, how, does, how do UFOs affect aircraft? Those kinds of questions. And, no, I really didn't run across any of those documents. I can tell you I wish I would, though. I mean, I think it would be so fantastic if we could get some official documentation, on, you know, relating to the abduction phenomenon. I don't think there's very much of it, if any that, you know, has been verified, and um, I think it would be a huge breakthrough if we did. But, um, I mean, I'm sure that there's some that deal with beings and things like that, but I can't, I, mean, I wish I had run across something like that, but I, I just haven't. But, again, I wasn't focusing on that aspect of it, so maybe that should be the next big investigation. Book number two. Yeah. There you go. See, now, I, I know um, we've had some people talk about um, something called Project Serpo, and are you familiar with that? Yeah, although I, you know, I, I, it's not the kind of thing I spend time with. I mean, I know sure. what it is. I, I know that there are all these internet postings about it, and I have a vague sense of it. But I can't tell you that I've been reading all of it. Yeah. So you, you, you never ran anything across anything like that in your, uh, in your research or uh, investigations? No, unfortunately, not. No, just sort of the, you know, the standard uh, case studies and official data and that kind of stuff. Can you share with us some of these uh, case studies? Yeah, I mean, some of them, of course, are, are cases that your audience is probably already familiar with um for instance the iranian case of 1976 which has a, a, a you know a fabulous three-page defense intelligence agency document that was written by the u.s government and details everything that happened 
Um, you know, and I again, that's to me the document is one aspect of it, but what I've done in the book is I've had the pilot for that case, the, the lead pilot actually write his own chapter about what happened when he tried to shoot this thing down. Wow. So yeah, every case is kind of that I present in the book is kind of a combination of lots of different elements. It's multiple witnesses, it's radar, it's you know the account of the witnesses involved, it's landing traces on the ground, you know, um, how it's affecting aviation. There's a whole lot of components, and I I think um, so. You know, the, I mean, a lot of the cases, there's so many cases presented in the book, but some of the ones presented in more detail are the Iranian case of 76. Uh -huh. There's another case of 1980 with um, a pilot from Peru who actually did shoot a UFO. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. See, that one I, I actually haven't heard about. So. Yeah, he actually hit it, but it didn't affect it in the least. That's what's so extraordinary. It's kind of like, I've caught a fish this big, <laughs> but it broke my line. <laughs> yeah, he, he, just, uh, he watched the, these huge shells kind of get it. He called it, they sort of seemed to get absorbed by the UFO, but didn't wow. affect it. And then he had this cat and mouse kind of chase with this disc-shaped object for about 20 minutes over a, a base in Peru. His name is Oscar Santa Maria Huertas. And, um, yeah, it's an extraordinary case, very well documented because the, all thousand people at the base saw the object. You know, it was just – and there's also a government document written about that as well by the U.S. government. So I kind of like to draw on all these different components, you know, mm -hmm. to present a case that has so much solid information that it's, it's irrefutable and very hard to argue with. Yeah. Now, I, you know, I know with our audience themselves, you know, we, we have a kind of a mix of the people that are very – hardcore they've been researching this forever uh you know of course they'll sometimes argue with the person that's you know uh, we'll have a chat room and they'll argue that's not true you know mm -hmm. and then of course we also have the audience that uh especially locally that might not know as much about uh you know these kind of cases and, okay. and this is their first you know time hearing about it um, so i mean wh if you had to pick a case uh, and I'll, I, I know people hate these kind of questions, but, <laughs> uh, but you know that would say you know you got somebody that's out there that doesn't believe, uh, like Brandon here. I don't know if he believes that well or not mm -hmm. about yeah. UFOs. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. If you if you were gonna say a okay, you yeah, Biff. Okay, well Biff. Biff's <laughs> Biff's not a believer. Uh, he's our producer uh, mm -hmm. tonight. If you had to you know say okay, this is the case you need to look at. This will, you know, open your eyes and at least make you question that disbelief. What would you say it would be? Well, I mean, I would really, again, I think I'd go back to the um, Belgian case that we mentioned. I just want to clarify one thing, though, about the whole question of belief, because really sure, sure. There is, the issue really is not about belief. And in my book, I am not asking anyone to believe in anything. So okay. I just want to make that really clear that the issue is really about just looking at the official record. Look, this is what we know to be the case about this very strange phenomenon that we have not identified yet. And so, I, you know, to tell Biff, I'm not asking Biff to believe in anything extraterrestrial or to believe in something weird. It's really about, hey, you want to see what we actually know? Mm -hmm. And that sort of um, – so I, I always want to sort of clarify okay. that, that yeah. I don't think you have to believe in anything to, to just sort of be curious about what the data says. I'm stuck in the X Files generation. Yeah. Here. <laughs> I have an I want I want to believe poster and I Exactly that's and that's he true. Does. I that's do. a component. For sure. But I just I thought you know, I just like to make that clear for people that don't want to believe they don't have to believe anything to read the book. So, I'm so not asking them to. Would you say that you're asking them just to not, you know, kinda like the media uh, some of the media people sometimes it'll kinda like poke fun and not even not even look at what they're looking at, just kinda Oh, here's another one of those crazy people, you know, and it's not even question or not even have an open mind about it. You're asking them not to do that. Is that yeah, right? basically, that's, that's yeah. exactly right. I'm really just asking them to have an open mind and just to consider the the official record. I mean, yeah. you know, if if you, you, it's not fair to take five generals who have each have written chapters for my book and just dismiss it all before giving the generals a shot, right? Yeah, exactly. you're talking about very Cause, high because because this isn't people. your word. This is the word of you know several. High-ranking officials in different countries, you know. Exactly. And they've written their own chapters. I'm not even – I'm letting them do it directly for the reader. And so basically, yes, I'm asking the person to just have an open mind and just consider what this book says. And I'd be, I respect any opinion that anybody wants to have. I just ask them if they could read the book first before they form their opinion. Wow. And, you know, that's all. I mean, you know, just, just consider it. It's, it's 
interesting, but then they, they, can, they can do whatever they want with that information. But uh, you can't dismiss something before you learn something about it, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. It's, it's about open-mindedness and, and skepticism of the right kind, because I think there's a really good kind of skepticism to have, which is just to be, to be questioning everything and to be skeptical, but not to be of the debunking mindset, which is sort of the, the, the wrong kind of skepticism, where you just – you're so skeptical that you're not even willing to look at anything or read anything or think about it. And, and really, you're not willing to consider what the evidence might be. And that's, that's what we want to avoid. But, yeah. you know, I just, I just have to emphasize this Belgian case, you guys, because I picked that case to open up the whole book. Yeah. And one of the reasons was I think it is, it's a really great one to sort of present to somebody like, your friend who who you know just doesn't want to be open to this because nothing that nothing too weird happened for instance the Rendlesham Forest case is a grace case but there was a lot of weird stuff that happened that might be harder for people to accept the Belgian case was just these repeated sightings over and over again and it's so well documented crafts. yeah it's so well documented and we have a major general of the Belgian Air Force telling us about it in the book and when you read it i just think it's very very hard to not the picture, realize the that pictures something was going amazing. on there. Yeah, the pictures See, are cool. Yeah, I'm looking at the picture right now, and, and the thing with this picture, and for those that might have the book at home, I'm not even sure exactly. I've never seen – I've seen the first one. The, uh, You're the talking one, about the photograph? Yeah, I'm looking at the photograph. See right. Of the triangle itself, the first one with the lights, but you really don't see the outline of it. And But, you know, the lights are kind of in a triangular pattern. Mm-hmm. I had never seen the second two. The first one w- is the one where the first one of the other two are the slightly ex- overexposed, mm-hmm. and you can see the outline. But the third one, uh, with the uh, kind of talking about the presence of the strong magnetic field, uh, in, you know, and that's you can really kind of I know wh- exactly what you're talking about the kind of the halo. Yeah, isn't that interesting? You see the little particles around it, kind mm-hmm. of little halo that looks like little absolutely almost like individual light particles or something and then yeah i mean this this photograph has been so well analyzed and they know exactly who took it they know the circumstances you know everything about it and i think it's one of the best ufo pictures i've ever seen yeah i don't know how you guys feel so i mean reading that belgian chapter and then the major general who and describes all the things they did to try to figure out what these were including going to the high levels of the united states government and asking, could this, is this one of your stealth aircraft? Yeah. And we have the kind of relationship with our NATO friends that when we are test flying something over their country repeatedly, which we don't do anyway, but let's say we were, we certainly tell them about it. You know, that's not the kind of thing that you hide from you, one of your allies. It just things don't work that way. And so Major General de Brouwer was certainly convinced after he talked to these officials that this was not an American aircraft. It was not some Russian aircraft, and th- he remains to this day mystified about what it was. That's, um, you know, he still wants to know. Um, and they even sent up F-16s after these things to try to get a better look at them. I mean, they made an absolutely proactive, you know, effort that put it. They put energy into trying to figure out what these things were. And yeah, and, and that's that it's good, you know, that they did that. Right, absolutely, and it sets an example. I think for our country and for other countries, they, they just uh, did exactly what you would expect a country to do, and they all the different government agencies were cooperating with each other. And they also had a scientific group, a civilian group of scientists who came together and helped tremendously with collecting witness reports and saving, you know, documenting it and getting all the drawings. And they have volumes and volumes and volumes of reports about this, which is something that the government officials might not have had time to do. And it's exemplary that they actually cooperated with a group of scientists who were yeah. not part of the government. Yeah. And, you know, we don't have that happening here, that's for sure. <laughs> well, so. not that they tell us. Yeah, yeah right. but these were, these were civilian scientists. These were not like some secret hand-picked group that were keeping anything secret. You know, these were guys from the university. So, yeah, I mean, maybe we have some secret scientists that are working on stuff, but it would be like as if, you know, a group like NARCAP or some group of, you know, Fantastic university program. scientists in America came together and started working with the Air Force on UFO cases. I mean, that's not something that we've seen happening and makes a lot of sense for a good way to handle these things. Do you think, again, though, that that's something, you know, I think we've spoke to some, prof- uh, you know, college professors, university professors here uh, on the show that they just don't want to, once again, get associated with Uf- UFOs because there's a stigma that – you know, especially, uh, and I don't know how it is in other countries, but 
you know, you kind of have the uh, tenure here. You want to get it. You don't want to lose your job, you know, because it's a cushy job. They don't want to endanger that at all because the university doesn't want to have you uh, associated with them if you're going into the fringe sciences of, you know, UFOs or any of these kind of you big know, feet. What, you know, Bigfoot, <laughs> ghost. I mean, you know, you don't want to get into that. Just, you know, don't don't rock the boat. Which yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, you're absolutely right. I think that's there's probably a, there are a lot more scientists that would be interested in this if they felt they had the freedom to do it. And because for all the reasons you just said, they don't. They're afraid of ridicule and the attitudes of their colleagues, and yeah. then they're not going to get their grant money. And no, you're absolutely money right. rules it all. It's a big problem, and I, you know, I understand that. You you don't want to lose your job. Yeah, uh, we got another question from Josh One Thousand. Uh, in your book, does it touch on the 1952 sightings over the U.S. Capitol? Uh, it says it was the front page story on the Washington Post. Yeah, we do actually touch on that in the book. Um, it's not we don't I don't go into it in a huge amount of detail because um, I really the book focuses the cases we go into detail are all after the close of Project Blue Book because I wanted to have more recent cases. But okay. we do cover that in the book. It's in a, it's in one of the chapters that deals with sort of the history and overview of the history and deals with the whole issue of how the debunking problem got got launched in, in 1952 by the, or three, I think it was, by the Robertson panel. So I do have some information about it, but for somebody who already knows the case, um, I'll be honest and tell you, you're not going to learn anything that you don't already know. Um, but it is, so, but it is, it is definitely there. Now, I, there was another photograph here that I wanted to ask you about, because when I first opened the book, you know, I, I'm flipping through and I get to the photographs. It's the first photograph that's in the book. And I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen it before. It's from an aerial mapping of aircraft. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, so it's looking down on the earth. And it's actually photographs a, you know, disc-shaped object. Right. From like above. I said, it kind of looks like hi-hat symbols. Yeah. yeah. I know. It looks like it's got a little pom-pom on the top, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like a little hat. No, I, I agree with you. I think this may be my absolutely number one favorite UFO photograph, Me actually. Too. It's nice. Be and one of the extraordinary things about it is, as you say, it's actually looking down on a UFO. I mean, yeah. how many pictures do we have that are when we're above a UFO? And the way it was taken was it was a government aircraft that had a camera strapped underneath its fuselage outside the plane. And it was just at, at, at every in intervals, I think it was seven seconds or something, it was just taking automatic pictures of the ground as it flew over with very large negatives because they were mapping the ground. Yeah. So there was a lot of detail in the negatives, and it was just an automatic process. And, and they're the, you know, when they went to develop the film, uh, one of the frames had this extraordinary disc-shaped object in it. And it's, it's, it's just so totally credible because this was a government plane that took it. This is not some, somebody hoaxing a picture. And it's been thoroughly studied and analyzed, and you know, scientific studies have been published on it. And it's such a clear picture. I just, I think it's great. You can see the sun reflecting off the top of the yeah. thing. So um, it is one of my absolute favorites, and it, that's why we put it first in the book. It's just a spectacular picture. I guess my question is, you know, because we don't have too much time here, you, what? Well, for, what are you going to be? What's your plans? I guess for the future, are you going to kind of continue into the UFO field, or uh, do, doing more research, maybe in a different angle? Or well, actually, the next step that I want to undertake is to try and 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 as as I described in the book, to get some kind of an official office set up within the U.S. government that can properly investigate UFOs. Or to do something. I mean, that's sort of our ideal, but to do something that will actually provide structural change to the paradigm of how we look at the subject. I mean, to the, act, the, the, the specific way that the U.S. government handles it. So whether it will be going through the National Academy of Sciences or going through a congressional committee to get some little agency set up within the Air Force or something like that, um, you know, we definitely, I want to do some, make some concrete change, and that was really why the book was written. That was my motivation and my inspiration for writing it, was just to have it be a, a tool for actual change. So my next step is going to be to actually be working in various meetings and with various people to try and bring about a, a, a change like that within our government. And um, wish me luck, because it's, <laughs> it's not an easy challenge, but I'm really committed 
to doing my very best, and I have some people already, you know, very important people that are willing to help that believe yeah. that this should happen. And um, that's going to be a real focus for me. Right now I'm very much interested in just getting people's attention on the book so that the more people that read this book, the more respect that it gets, the more successful I'm going to be because then, you know, it becomes more useful as a tool. No, uh, so I just want people to read it, and that's why I'm doing a lot of just talking about it now, and then I'm going to be working more within Washington to really see what I can do to make a change. Now, one last question. Uh, since your book came out uh, and, you know, you've been going on all these interviews and going public with everything, uh, has have you heard from anyone in the government or, you know, has anyone tried to contact you? about? Um, no, not any current official. Well, how about, no. you know, just um, I mean, somebody that's, you know, that, I guess, maybe whistleblower kind of thing or, or you know, retired official, retired military, any of them? No, not, no, nothing really significant. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not. Um, Does anyone call your house and hang up? <laughs> <laughs> no, no guys knocking uh. on my door with sunglasses and black suits. Oh. I hate to disappoint you guys. Well, I, <laughs> that was my next question. Men yeah, in black. No, now I what mean, are we gonna do? <laughs> if so, I'm, run. <laughs> I'm determined that to have this book bring people out, though. I mean, I think, I think it's a little too early. I, you know, I don't, I don't think the fact that that hasn't happened means it won't. I mean, there I, you go. I think. Hey, when that happens. Yeah, I'm going to be hanging around and making a lot of connections and talking to a lot of people, and I'm, you know, I'm just hoping that over time we'll get some new information and some new people coming forward as a result of the book. I can't guarantee it, but um, I'm hopeful that that will happen. All but right. um, so far I haven't had anybody jumping up and down to contact me, but I often think it, it takes a while and it can be done. It's done quietly and discreetly. And, um, you know, that could happen. Well, no, I know I was impressed. You had John Podesta, uh, you know, uh, do the forward of the book. And I'm hoping, you know, that that, you know, opens up some doors maybe with the current administration or, or I someone, agree with you, and you know. I'm, I'm hopeful of that myself. And certainly he's an extremely well-connected and um, effective person in Washington, an important Just you know, Just go straight to the advisor, top. So. What, yeah, absolutely. He's telling Obama, I want to talk to him now. <laughs> exactly. If only I could do that. <laughs> no, I want to let um, you know we got we have uh, your book put up on our website, whispersradio.com, uh, so that any of our listeners uh, want to check it out. It'll it's a it has a picture, and you click you click on it, and it takes you right to where you can buy the book. Thanks so much, and I could just give out my website too. It's okay. ufosontherecord.com. It's sort of an abbreviation of the book's title and that. I have information there about the book and a blog and all kinds of stuff, and the buttons are there, too, for ordering it. So and either Nick, place. Nick's telling me also that's linked up to our site as well. We got you. Fantastic. I hope everyone will check it out. Go to ufosontherecord.com. I've also got a Facebook page. We've got lots of interesting discussions going on. So um, I look forward. I love hearing from people who have read the book and hearing what people think about it. So Well, Nick hasn't stopped talking about it since he got it. So. Oh, that's yep. fantastic. <laughs> Glad yes, to hear that. And, you know, I love amazing. to hear people's opinions about our proposals for change, too, about this new uh, policy proposal that we have in the book regarding the U.S. government. And um, always open to feedback and ideas and suggestions and everything else. So That's awesome. Well, we want to thank you for your time today, and uh, you'll definitely be hearing back from us. Fantastic. We'd love to come back. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. 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 Nikki, what? Wait a second. Yeah. Calm down. Calm down. We've got to go to Biff first. That's where I wanted to go. Yes. You looked at the pictures. Yeah. What do yeah, you think? Yeah, those are uh, they're pretty amazing, especially the the ones that showed the the triangle of mm -hmm. the of the UFOs. And, you know, when, when you first looked at it, the, it it's, it's kind of uh, amazing how they actually got the, got the picture. I'm going to hand it over to Brandon again because I think he flipped through them, but now that we've got a little contact. Now, that's what, when I sat – when I came into the station, Nick just – Flopped it open and said, "Look at these." You know, I, that's my thoughts too. I was like, "Wow!" And th and then the other one, the the one you guys were mm -hmm. talking about on the first page, that view too. That one, that yeah, one's was pretty, pretty neat. Crazy, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and that's I've seen. Like I said, I've seen the first. You know, that first picture. You know, that's a pretty famous picture. You know, in the UFO community, I had never seen the you know the overexposed and the, they kind of try to bring it as soon as you bring out that shape. Because that shape's there, you know. I mean, it's. I, I can't think of anything that we have that has that shape. This is, and I'm, we're talking back in the '90s too. I mean, I think we've talked on the show about uh, when, when we had Manuel, uh, you know, on, and he was talking about maybe you know some of the. Well, I think it was Manuel, and then we also talked to the guy, uh, 
the the tech advisor for um I can't remember the group off the top of my head right now. But, you know, they were talking about other ships that were kind of U.S. government was working on, but we're talking those are out now. This is the '90s, you know. So right. why would those ships be flying over, you know, Brazil, yeah. Brazil or Belgium? One second. Belgium. Belgium. Like, why would those ships be? <laughs> well, maybe Belgium. <laughs> right next to you. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're kind of close. <laughs> it's a B country, you know. So, I mean, but why would they be there? That's the question, and. I don't know. So, you know, it's, it's, it's NATO. NATO I, no, I, I, I didn't mean to like throw out that you don't believe because I, I don't know your opinion on that either way. But what what do you think after seeing pictures like that? I mean, I, I think it's it's amazing, really, that that someone can take a picture like like those two. Well, really, the, the three that I saw and you look at them and. And it's, it's it's kind of amazing. It it, it does make you wonder. It makes you think. It, yeah. it does. It, it makes you think. This is another one. This is from 1987. This is from the Hudson Valley Wave, and we didn't get into this one. I'm going to go and take it. You guys can talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I know what okay. you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it looks like it would be lights on the outside of a circular disc. Yeah, you know, bunch of like, probably like, what, 30 lights, you'd yeah. say? That 20, 30 lights. Too. That's pretty good. It looks like a like a light show. That that someone just took and just connected different lights and made a half circle out right, of it. Right, right, right. Pretty cool. Yeah, but like I, you know, like I said before, the reason I like like the book is I like that. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> just sit down and start talking without the headset, or no? Oh, I hear it now. Biffy's X filing it, it, it up. My favorite show, Nick. All right, it is, it is time for awesome CNN show. news. We got like two minutes, don't we? Do we? Yeah. No. Okay. Can you get what? How much time we got left? Twenty seconds. Twenty. <laughs> oh. We'll be right back Four after CNN. Minutes. You're listening to Whispers <laughs> Radio here on AM sixteen hundred WKKX. Darn the. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Whispers Radio here on AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog, and UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is 708, 45 degrees out here in downtown Wheeling. I'm Jordan Klein here with Nick Queen, Brandon Palmer, and the lovely Biff Leonard. No. <laughs> and the new believer, Biff Leonard. <laughs> Uh, you know, last week we were discussing with Lola, and she's like, you know what the difference between me and you is when I... You're on vacation. You call in and try to be on the show. And when I go on vacation, you're not going to hear from me till I get back. Well, hey, Lola. <laughs> oh, hello. Sucker. <laughs> you knew he's going to rub that in your face, right? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. How's Key well, West? It is warm and beautiful and sunny and laid back and Everything I always wanted to live with is here. That's for sure. <laughs> well, are you trying to tell us something? Are you coming back? <laughs> yeah, no. I am. I am. Uh. But oh, it's just—it's been absolutely gorgeous here, and we've been walking so much. Gosh, my legs hurt. Everything, but and the dog's been just having the best time ever because she's got to swim in the ocean every single day. Oh, and there you go. She's been in restaurants and all kinds of stuff, and yeah, you know, did, everybody here is just so friendly and nice. Did you find nice. Did you find you a man in cowboy boots? No, but I got I've got some pictures to show you when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are, there was are these men wearing anything at all? No, 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 no listen to me. Listen, <laughs> yeah, we're on we're on I don't know one of the many many freeways on our way down, and it was it was dark out, and we passed this truck that had this cowboy scene painted on the side. <laughs> and so I was kind of like playing tag with it. You know, I'd, he'd pass me, and then I'd pass him, one of those things. He'd All of a sudden, we get behind him. Take his picture. Now, wait a minute. I, I get I behind him. I finish the story. I get behind him, and there is a cowboy boot hanging from the back of his trailer. <laughs> so here's Linda hanging out the car window, trying to take pictures of this cowboy boot. <laughs> You know it was I a trap, we, right? 
<laughs> like a mousetrap. You, you know the government yeah. listens to our show too. They know what you want. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, there is one little one uh, one guy that drives one of those. Brandon will know what I'm talking about. It's like the little cab, but they, it's attached to a bicycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, oh my gosh, this guy is hot. If I can find him tonight, <laughs> I'll bet they're off on ghost hunting, I can tell you. Tell us what you're getting into tonight, love. Uh, we are taking a walking ghost tour, and um, hopefully after it's all over with, the most haunted place, Brandon may know what it is, it's called the Porter House. Yeah, I think I've um, heard of that, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a bar in there that supposedly... Champagne flutes come off of those racks that, you know, they slide them on, so it's not like they're just sitting there. They slide off and then very gently go all the way to the floor. Yeah, I've and heard about seen, that down there. Yeah, full-body apparitions there and wow. um, pictures, of orbs or lights in some of the upper windows because Miss Dr. Porter was born in that house and died in that house, and they say he's still there. So, um that's where that's one place we're headed, and then there's a graveyard right downtown that we're going to check out after the uh, ghost tour. You know, so I mean, there's a that lot sounds of like fun. I know what this what? means. We ruined her. No, Lola's that... Lolo, Lolo about to have another experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was yeah. talking to Donna, who runs that, um, you know, she knew about the pen and all that kind of stuff. So. You know, and she had heard of UPRN, so believe me, I um, I utilized that connection. <laughs> <Heck yeah. laughs> but it's, it's just been really, it's been really great. It just, you know, now my sister is convinced that we have a ghost here. Really? And, at, uh, at the house or the hotel? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, what it is is um, six little cottages that are all they're all laid out really close to each other but you're, it's kind of private too and you've got your own little porch area and uh so one night we were sitting out here and put the k2 out and started asking questions and i'm not really convinced but she is <laughs> so because we kept getting responses but some of them weren't weren't real quick so, you know so would but, you say it was a good experience yeah yeah it was, <laughs> well and and the dog Immediately, once we started asking questions, the dog went in and got underneath the um, dresser. Really? Like, yep, don't want no part of this. <laughs> and every once in a while, she'll, she'll just kind of look funny and scoot inside. So, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. You could be living in an experience, darling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> No, wait a second. Are we talking about the guy with the cowboy boot hanging from the back of his truck, hey, or are we talking about the hotel room? <laughs> any any experience at this point will work for me. Oh. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about you last night. Uh, we were watching Dancing with the Stars, and uh, Margaret Cho comes out, and all of a sudden the song is, uh, uh, her name was Lola. <laughs> she, oh, she was, I saw that. Yeah, I, saw I was that. like, there's Lola, you know. It's like she's going to enjoy this. <laughs> Oh, well, you won't recognize me either. I got my hair cut. Oh, really? What? Yes, really. Short. Really short? <laughs> really like, short. Like Brandon short? No, not Brandon short. <laughs> Maybe Jordan short, right? Oh. No. <laughs> Don't go that route either. So long on the sides and real, real thin on top. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not reduced to wearing a ball cap. Let's just put it that way. But. So, well, I just, I know I said I wasn't going to call, but I just called. had to. Oh, we're glad yeah. to hear from you. Hey, we were actually right. hoping we were talking about that before. She was like, when did Lola call? She was <laughs> like, when there's I... no way she's going to call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I had to. I had to. I wanted to tell you about taking the ghost tour, you know, so hopefully next Tuesday I'll have some real good stories. Yeah, well, yeah, did you bring a recorder too. or anything? I've got two recorders. There you nice. go. But, like, I... I the camera's dead, so Aww. we're going to buy a throwaway. I hope that will will work, you know, if we get one with a flash. Yeah. But, um, yeah, because there's, there's a couple, three pawn shops around <laughs> here, and I thought tomorrow I'm going to go buy, you know, a used camera. But um, it just ticked me off that, you know, today of all days when I, you know, I knew we were taking this tour, that's yeah. when it decided to die. But well, hey, get some good uh 
get some good stuff for us to play on the show next week. Yeah, next week we'll have uh, uh, Sean B on, but the first 30 minutes we'll, we'll, talk we'll be, about we'll be talking with you about your experience. Okay. All, All right. right. Good luck with that little taxi cab. Ah, uh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Bye, Lola. Bye, guys, and have see a ya. great show. All right, Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we ruined oh, her. You remember, yeah. remember when she first started the show, she's like, I don't buy any of that stuff. <laughs> I'm only going to be your producer for a week until they find somebody else. I think at one point she's like, you got to gotta find someone else. <laughs> I can't do the voice as well. No. You go ahead and do that again. No. <laughs> I'm mad. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> now she's calling us from Key West. Guess what, guys? I'm going on a ghost hunt. <laughs> we, no, here's, here's the even worse part about it. It's not just like, hey, look, there's a ghost hunt. <laughs> Those guys are silly. We should go on it. No, she brought two recorders. <laughs> and she's she's like, going to a pawn shop to buy cameras. She's got a K2 meter she's, in the hotel room. She, she's she's running her K2 meter trying to talk to 18th century men in her <laughs> hotel room. <laughs> we, we ruined her. <laughs> Nikki, you want to introduce our next guest? Yes, I can do that. And I hope I don't butcher the last name, but uh, Ursula Bilski is the founder of Chicago Hauntings. and uh, She's a historian, author, and parapsychology enthusiast. Uh, wrote a bunch of books on uh, the hauntings in Chicago. Uh, we're going to be talking with her about her new book, There's Something Under the Bed. Bum, uh, bum, bum. <laughs> Ursula, are you with us? I'm here. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Tell us about this new book, There's Something Under the Bed. This is my first book that is uh, for a national audience. My six previous books are all about Chicago's haunted history, so I'm kind of branching out there. But the book is has kind of been a lifetime in the making. It's it takes into account my own experiences growing up in what we believed was a haunted house here in really? Chicago and um, kind of includes so many of the stories that I've heard from people over. I've been investigating for just over 20 years now and uh, there, you know, I've kind of always had the back of my mind all the stories that I heard from kids and um, experiences that seem to be particular to children. So this is uh, a book that grew out of a presentation that I did at a conference in Seattle a few years back um, about children's experiences with the paranormal. Mm. So it's kind of an overview of all the sorts of phenomena that uh, children are involved with and looks a lot at why children seem to have more pronounced experiences with the paranormal and, and why they seem to lessen as we get older. Now, would you say that this is a children's book? Absolutely more? not. There we go. The <laughs> book just came out a couple of months ago, and I've already had, like, angry parents. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, oh, my God. I told the, the publishers, the book cover um, is uh, it's a, it's about this beautiful, you know, um, painting that one of the artists did at New Page Books of this beautiful young girl under their covers in her bed and she's got her covers pulled up to her chin and it's kind of there's stars and sort of mists like around the bed yeah. and it looks lovely and I was like I don't I, that's not really the message that this <laughs> book is sending like a la 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 I'm going to bed now no it's <laughs> it's very scary and it's, it's probably got a lot more scary stuff than I've ever had in any book before. And so, yeah, the, the, the children that have picked it up so far um, have had kind of a... Are going to be in therapy for a long time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're, they're covering your second book. There's still something under the bed. <laughs> Says my doctor. <laughs> so, you know, I have to say before we even get started on this, I I have this issue with, with kids and you know ghosts and nick's scared clouds. to death of kids anyway yeah the, the <laughs> kids are scary well but, like there's this uh new movie coming out uh i think it's called let them in or something like that right a vampire kid little girl vampire or something right. like that it freaks me out and <laughs> you know the the grudge with the little girl it, these things are scary to me uh the shining left an indelible mark that'll oh, never the, leave the two girls the two little girl, if i you know i still repeat if i'm ever at the mall and there's two little girls in blue dresses i will make a scene i will run <laughs> and he will you should hear him scream oh, oh yes. my god <laughs> so you know I, I saw this and i'm like this looks really interesting but should i book her? i'll probably have nightmares but you give me some nightmares and we'll we'll do that i mean can, can we hear some of the stories? Can you can you tell us some of these stories with kids? 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's there's so many things that kids seem to be aware of that adults are not. And the theory is that as children grow older, they kind of um, pick up from adults what they are expected to accept and what uh-huh. they're expected to reject. And so as they get older, their their brains actually develop according to that, and they start to unconsciously push things out, push experiences out that they deem to be unacceptable to parents as adults. So, you know, what we hear from kids a lot of the times, you know, one of the things that um, when I had my first daughter, I have two little girls, when I had my first daughter 11 years ago, you know, one of the things that I experienced with her right off the bat, which is something a lot of parents experience, is that they, they seem to be aware of uh, beings or people that we're not aware of. And even we'll sometimes call them by name, you know, grandma oh. or grandpa or uncle this or aunt that. And so, people so this that goes this on. goes beyond uh, just um, imaginary friends. You, we're not talking about just sitting in the corner talking to, you know, Shelly the big dinosaur. Exactly. I mean, they really seem to have an awareness, and they will even uh, be able to sometimes uh, identify someone who passed away years before they were born from a photograph by name. Really? Uh, they'll know details about them. And this goes into something very interesting. People have asked me already what was the most interesting thing that you found researching this book? And without a doubt, it was uh, children who remember past lives. Uh, Ian Stevenson, Stevenson, the late parapsychologist, did, I think, 40 years of research in ch- into children who remember past lives. Really? did a lot of his work in India and Pakistan, but all over the world. And it was fascinating to to read about the research that he did and to read that there are a lot of mainstream scientists that think that this body of evidence, this body of research um, into children's past life experiences will be the first thing that's verified as normal, as part of science that we have previously thought of as paranormal. But the most interesting thing is these kids, um, they, you know, they not only remember the lives of people who have died, names, dates, family members, but even when they meet the families and the friends of these people that they claim they were before, they will recognize the people when they see them. The big example that we saw in the news a few times over the last few years was little James Leiniger. He was this little boy that his parents now believe was reincarnated from a World War II fighter pilot, James Houston. Hmm. And this little boy, James Leiniger, his the first words he said were waking up in his crib at a year and a half old saying, you know, man trapped in plane, can't get out, can't get out. And he started drawing pictures of a man, you know, in a burning plane and started to say that he was James Houston, the second, that his plane was uh, such and such a name that he was stationed on uh, the uh, aircraft carrier Natoma. The family tracked these uh, people down, these facts down, and found that there was a, the aircraft carrier USS Natoma in World War II, that there was a man stationed on it named James Houston. They identified the plane that James had identified as the one that he had flown. And they actually took little James, who was just a few years old, to like a reunion of these guys that had been stationed on the Natoma. And James ran up and hugged them and called them by name. Wow. And they were like, you know, 80-something years old. And uh, it's it's really fascinating. Uh, The late uh, Ian Stevenson found that a lot of these kids that remember these past lives, they uh, remember the way that they died. And just like our kids will act out, you know, being a doctor, being a mom or dad, whatever, they would act out um, not only the occupations of the life that they remembered, you know, obscure things, um, but they would also have birthmarks that corresponded to the death wounds that they remembered. For example, there was a little boy, there's a picture uh, in the book, of a little boy that was g- born with stunted finger growth. All of his fingers were stunted, mm-hmm. as if they had been cut off. That, that's what it looks like. And it's a rare, rare medical condition. But the little boy, as he got old enough to talk, said that in a previous life he had been a man who he named by name, who lived in a neighboring town, and that his fingers had been cut off in a uh, by a, a farm implement, and he had died as a result of the injury. And this is not one isolated case, but dozens, I mean, scores of cases that Dr. Stevenson um, lined up with actual medical records. So very, very fascinating. Wow. 
I don't even know what to say to that. Yeah, wow. the, the, I'm still stuck on the James Lyon thing. No, see, I, I saw I saw a video. Uh, it was a movie on one of the like the Discovery Channel, History Channel, something like that. Travel Channel. I mean, they all showed like those documentaries of, of some paranormal stuff. But uh, it was a little boy who had always said that he, you know he remembered his whole past life, knew his name, uh, would draw a picture of the house, said the country, said everybody in his family's name, uh, you know, knew it all. And uh, the TV show actually like paid to send this little boy and his family out to wherever it was. And when they got to the city, the boy gave like step by step directions on how to get to the house, and like walked through, like was walking with his mother through the house. You know, this is where. You know, so and so's room was this was, and this was like 50, 60 years prior. You know, to this, the house was still there, and like the picture of the dog. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. Interesting, very, very interesting. Well, now, I, you know, I know we've talked before. Uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan's brother has. You, uh, you don't want to talk. About it. Don't want to talk about it. All right, well, we won't talk about it. I'm sorry. Uh, but you know different experiences though that where you know we've actually spoke with kids that do see things more readily that um, uh, that almost you know to the point of where they're seeing they're the only ones in the house seeing anything it's starting to scare their parents <coughs> and you know they don't know what to do with it uh, they're scared out to death because you know the first question is okay we, you know is it a ghost or are they having, I don't want to, you know, are they crazy? I mean, I don't want to, I, I hate Childhood that, schizophrenia. Yeah, you know, and they don't know what to do. You know, do, do you call a, a paranormal investigation group or do you call the, you know, therapist? You know, do you deal with that a lot, uh, you know, with families like this or? Yeah, it's interesting. There are, you know, again, um, we always think, you know, we always think of the sixth sense where this little boy has the ability to see the dead and that it's a very unusual thing. But it really seems that there is a lot of children that have these experiences. And they, you know, they, they're they just part of their experiences of everyday life. They don't really take real notice of them. You know, if they do talk about them, they end up categorized as invisible friends. And uh, that's pretty much it. You know, sometimes it gets more difficult. One of the first um, stories I ever heard years ago was a little boy growing up here in Chicago that was just like the boy in the Sixth Son, Sally Joel Osment's character, mm -hmm. where, you know, he was very young. Uh, the first time it happened, they had gone to a funeral, and they were at the cemetery for the burial. And they went home. The little boy said that he had seen these beings in the cemetery that no one else had seen them in great detail and it actually wandered off to you know play with some children that he said were there that no one else saw and I don't know if it's it started that day I don't know if it had was experience of being at the cemetery that made it start happening um, but you know he went home and he started to see dead people everywhere they went and this seems very suspect, you know, because he went to a funeral, and it's probably it was probably the first person that he knew that had passed away. I think it was his aunt, and uh, you think hmm, maybe this kid was, you know, had gone off the deep end because of this whole death experience with the aunt. But as time went on, the uh, the mother began to realize that there was really something to this because he was actually. Um, knowing information about people that had died that he had no way of knowing. And then some of the first experiences were so chilling. I still, you know, sometimes wake up at night and think about them. He said, um, the mom said that he, uh, after the aunt had died, in the weeks that followed, um, he would come into his bedroom after school and see the aunt jumping on his bed. This was after she had passed away. He also, they had large dogs in the house. They uh, would train dogs. And these big dog cages in the uh, kitchen and the garage. And the little boy would say that he would see the aunt actually sitting in the dog cages, like, really? you know, after she had, isn't that chilling? And uh, so, yeah, so the, these were the first things that started. We're seeing, you know, the aunt after she had passed away, but these things went on. And, you know, years later, I, um, you know, I, I, there were so many of these kinds of stories. My brother is in, the, uh, in uh, naval intelligence, and he's been overseas a lot of different places in the last few years with the reserves. 
And uh, he told me this one story about a friend that he worked with. Um, he had co- actually come home from the Gulf War years ago. And a friend of his had been in the war as well. And he was kind of all by himself. He kind of had a hard time in life. So he offered his friend to come and stay with him and his family. And this gentleman was married, and he had two young boys at home. So this other guy, his friend from the, from the military, moved in. And it was sort of great and sort of, sort of terrible because... Um, the, the guy was a great friend to the boys. He was a big help. He would help her out around the house, and it was a lot of fun to be around. But he'd also go into these depressions where he would lock himself into his room that they gave him in the basement. Mm. Well, he eventually hanged himself in the house. And after the death, the boys would could start complaining that Uncle Jeff would come in the room every night and try to get into bed with them and would talk and not let them go to sleep and would pull the covers off of them. And this went on for many, many months. They didn't know what to do about it, and they were ab- absolutely horrified. The boys weren't sleeping, and it came to the point where they had a family party, and someone took a photograph. It was like the grandmother's birthday. And in the photograph, everyone's around the table and around the cake, and one of the boys is at the end uh, of the picture, and he's got his hand stuck out to one side in this awkward fashion. And after they saw the picture, they asked him, what, why is your hand stuck out like that? And he said, I had my arm around Uncle Jeff. Ooh, oh, that's just scary. So they finally had a medium come in to try and talk to Uncle Jeff to get him to move on and to leave these kids alone and let them get their sleep and, and let the family get on with their lives. And it apparently it was, was successful. That's just the way it is with some uncles. They just won't leave. <laughs> <laughs> That's just creepy. I, I know uh, Jordan had sent me a book, uh, the book or a, a link to the book. I think somebody even bought it for me. With the, the other side. Uh, it's the other side. It's the actual. Uh, you describe it. You know a lot more about it than I do. Well, I read the first chapter. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, it was supposed to be what the Sixth Sense was based off of. You know, to some degree, mm-hmm. and a little boy that had been seeing, you know, ghosts and stuff like that his whole life. Right, Nick? Yeah, I think that was the one. Okay. Now, going, I guess, more into the paranormal, do you usually stay on just like actual ghost uh, uh, experiences? Uh, or I, I know you kind of go into the past life and stuff. But do you also kind of go into the UFO uh, arena at all? Uh, you know, with uh, children that are kind of experiencing UFOs? You know, I I am very much personally interested in UFOs. I haven't done a lot of, of overlap with UFOs in the work that I've done so far as far as my writing goes. But I I think a lot of people in the last few years especially are really starting to take notice of all the overlap that there does seem to be it, with ghosts and hauntings and uh cryptozoology and UFOs and all of the stuff that really seems to be interconnected. And, you know, when you think of, when I was a little girl, um, I had a family member that every single night, you know, I was having, you know, we all have dreams about monsters and ghosts and all those things. He never had any dreams about anything like that. The only dreams he had were of aliens, coming into his room at night and, you know, sometimes just looking at him, sometimes taking him away. He's grown up now, brilliant person, totally down to earth. Um, But he has always had um, different experiences. I mean, even when um, we, you know, the places where our family members lived, where there were strange things going on when we were kids, you know, we might hear footsteps or something like that, but he would always have heightened experiences and at this point you know when we're we're both in our 40s i think there's something different about him that he has some sort of sensitivity to these things um even though he's never looked never looked for these things as i have and is like i said couldn't be less interested in the paranormal but they he seems to have always had a heightened sensitivity and i think those dreams that he had when he was younger might have been some sort of interaction with something that you know we weren't aware of now you yourself have you were you when you were a child how how many experiences do you remember having it was 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 that something that was uh, common for you or 
It's interesting because, you know, people always ask me, are you sensitive? Do you have, you know, psychic abilities? And I always said no until I started working on this book. And I realized that the reason I was doing this book was because there were so many, maybe not direct experiences that I had, but that they, that they were all around me. The places that I were had these experiences. And the house I grew up in was a place where I had direct experiences. We moved in, or my parents bought what was known as the haunted house in the neighborhood. You know, every, every house has one. Oh, yeah. And this is the neighborhood where I still live on the north side of Chicago, not far from Wrigley Field. And it was an old house that my actually my great uncle had built. And my mom kind of had her eye on the house. It was very derelict when she and my dad bought it in the 1960s. Um, they moved in. They knew the reputation. They figured it was just a rundown house. So it had this reputation. And sure enough, the first night that they stayed in the house, they heard footsteps coming up the stairs in the middle of the night from the foyer to the second floor of the bedrooms were. Mm. And this is actually the first memory that I have in my life, is being woken up, wo- woken up in the middle of the night by these footsteps on the stairs. So this was, when I say it's something that was always there, it was always there from my first memory. And it's, it's strange because uh, I think as I grew up, I always had this kind of skewed perspective on things. I never quite knew what was so-called real and what was not real and what I was supposed to to acknowledge and what I was not supposed to acknowledge and that was that was very interesting there was my uh, uncle Gene's house a couple blocks away where the previous owner had hanged himself in the garage and every Wednesday night when my uncle went to his lodge meeting and my aunt was ironing the kitchen door would open by itself that led to the garage and she just assumed that this was the ghost out in the garage coming in, and for a couple of hours there would be things moving around and, and wow. all sorts of creaks. And my uncle was this very gross, kind of scary person, and she figured the ghost didn't want to come in the house when he was there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just very normal to her and acceptable. My grandmother's house, a couple other blocks away where my my mom had grown up, my grandmother's first child, Frances, had died when she was a baby, when she was just two months old of pneumonia in the front bedroom. And this was in, like, 1920. And even when we were kids, growing up in the 70s, we would hear a baby crying in that room when we'd sleep overnight there in the summertime. So, you know, when I say I didn't have a lot of direct experiences that were very profound, but there were little experiences like that that were everywhere. And it really informed the way I thought about things as I got older and what I was looking for and what I was willing to listen to and other people. Now, I got to ask this. Do you, you know, do you have any stories that will, you know, you'll guarantee will make me have nightmares tonight? <laughs> yeah, come on. It's October. Oh, my God. Let's, yeah, I have the Let's scare the story. crap out of Nick. The perfect story. Because this is, well, this is our October. We're trying to get, you know, the scariest <laughs> things we can this month. You know, to celebrate, of course, Halloween coming. I, I still want a serial killer month. We, we need <laughs> he's, he's begging for this. March. Huh? It's All right, go ahead. <laughs> Scary month, Starbucks. You're, you're our, our... Oh, this story, everyone always asks me, what's the scariest thing you ever heard? And I always had my stories. And uh, this one, and it's always, usually they ask me the scariest story in Chicago because that's what I've done so far. But now I get to tell the scariest story ever that doesn't have to do with Chicago. And this has to do with kids, so it's perfect. <laughs> we do uh, our Chicago hauntings tours uh, all year, and, and we do a lot of tours for school groups during the day teaching Chicago history through the ghost stories, very popular tours. Uh, well, last spring we had a tour group out on our bus, about 50 people, and um, we had all these kids out, and we had stopped for lunch, and I was sitting with some of the teachers having lunch and talking. And, of course, this subject turned to all these ghost stories. Well, one of the teachers told me that the year before, she and her husband had gone to New Orleans on uh, spring break. Mm -hmm. And her husband is an avid photographer. So he lugs all of his old cameras with him everywhere to get these different effects from the old, you know, vintage cameras. So he was taking pictures all week down in New Orleans with all of his different cameras, and they were staying at a hotel called the Cornstalk Fence Hotel, which a lot of people might be familiar with. 
This was originally an orphanage, and it gets its name from this beautiful wrought iron fence around the building that looks like stalks of corn growing. Well, there was at one point, hundreds of years ago, a fire in the orphanage, and a, a lot of the children in the orphanage perished in the fire, and so the building is believed to be haunted by the ghosts of the children. Well, when the couple got home from their week in New Orleans, uh, they had a great time. They went on one of the ghost tours, but they were mostly interested in just in the history and the culture. They certainly didn't have any paranormal experiences. They got home, and her husband had to develop all of this film from his old cameras that weren't digital. So when he developed the film from the cameras, one of the rolls of film had a photo on it of the couple sleeping in their bed in the hotel room oh. that was taken from several feet above the bed. Oh, my God. <laughs> I just got chills. <laughs> every time I tell, I've been told this story 300 times now, and all the uh. hair on the back of my neck stands up every time I tell it. No, wait a second. Is are that we, freakish? Okay. <laughs> like, like the ghost grab the camera and like yeah, yeah like, take like la 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 let's see what well, this does the, oh. either way is scary <laughs> I mean, that was what i did oh. <laughs> are we talking like directly above them or are we talking like at the directly foot of the above oh my them. god it's like a, yeah i mean you couldn't even get there like a normal person could not even get to where the picture was taken from wow mm-hmm. well that is wow. freaky well congratulations <laughs> not only is nick not going to be able to sleep tonight <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, now, get now either. Jordan will be sitting there like, wait a second, where's my camera? I'll be, I'll be calling Nick. Are you scared too? <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, I'm watching sitcoms. I gotta get oh, happy. Man. <laughs> I'm watching That's... Cartoon Network the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got any more of those? <laughs> Come on, you can't just leave me with one. <laughs> Jordan, I'm scared enough. <laughs> Nick, take your headphones off. <laughs> Um, oh man! Wow. <laughs> now, have you I seen this picture? Speechless. No, I have not seen the picture. Oh, okay, you gotta get a get a get a copy of that picture. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I would want that copy. <laughs> See, but now the question is: Do you lock your camera up at night? Now, I mean, I I think I would. I'd lock it up. I'd <laughs> you <can> burn it. <laughs> I'd give it. I'd give it to Biff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now, so that's you know that's the scariest you know that's two adults do you have a scary you know what's your scariest child child nah i can't talk you've you've scared me to death uh children's uh ghost story kind of thing yeah you know there's so many things that happen with kids and i think some of the most disturbing ones and i think people would agree uh are the things that happen with the ouija board when people start oh, using the ouija oh, board you're going there yeah, and oh, no, not the Ouija board conversation. Uh, you know, I, when I started writing about, I have a whole chapter on, it's called Fun and Games, about all sorts of paranormal games that, that you know, kids play. At this point, you know, at some point kids get to the place where they realize that, you know, it's not really acceptable to talk about ghosts and with adults and things. Yeah. So they go into this sort of world of their own where they can explore this stuff, um, you know, with with people their own age. And so the, they do the Bloody Mary game, you know, which I write about. They do light as a feather, stiff as a board. I was about you to know. say that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, which was interesting, I found a, an instance of that game being played in the 1600s in Europe. Um, where a, a, a very famous diarist describes coming upon this group of school children that were all kneeling on the ground around this this kid who was lying like he was dead, and they each put two fingers under him and chanted all of this stuff and lifted him off the ground. And he was so impressed by it, he went into um, into the house and got one of the the servants out of the house who was this big brusque man and he had him lay down (laughs) and had the kids lift him up too and this was you know hundreds of years ago it's very fascinating you know here in chicago we've got this uh version of bloody mary now that's uh, the candy man story you know great Mm -hmm. movie candy man and you know it's not uh you know the story of was always that it's not based on anything real you know we tell the story on our ghost tour and we go through cabrini green and talk about it yeah. point out the buildings that are still left well, and it's Claude, uh it's Claude always Barker, fun getting people it? off the bus there in the housing project they love it 
But uh, as I did research for this book, it was fascinating because Clive Barker apparently was not only inspired by the Bloody Mary story uh, and, you know, the legend in the game, but also by something that was going on in Liverpool where he grew up. And that was that there was, during the 1970s and 80s, there was this sort of urban legend figure that they called Purple Aki. And Purple Aki was, according to the young men who encountered him, this, like, six-and-a-half-foot-tall, burly, a black bodybuilder that would sodomize young men, like, try to to feel young men's muscles, attack people. <laughs> and it was just um, it was very, very interesting. And uh, it turned out that all these I, I young men... I have to men, stop you here for a second. <laughs> is um, somebody yelling in the background? Please, God, say there is. Okay, I hear a kid. <laughs> Nick, Nick, Nick was real scared. Well, well I look at I look at Nick Brandon. I'm like, little. what is that? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, hello. Hello. There we go. There okay. We go. I have no we idea. We might have ghosts in here. <laughs> uh, we were getting worried. We heard something, some somebody screaming. I guess maybe in the background. <laughs> and then we heard breathing. And then we're all looking at each other like. <laughs> Did you hear that too? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to stop because I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know what's happening. So. It was purple achy. Somebody's walking my car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, continue, continue with your story. Please. So after, I think it was like in 2001, lo and behold, and, and there were the, the, this, this character, I, adults never saw him only young people saw him kids and teenagers saw him and there were stories that he had been killed and that he had come back from the dead that he had drowned and had come back to life so it was this really monumental thing and this really frightening thing and a lot of people that grew up in liverpool during that 20 or 25 years said that it totally affected their childhood that they didn't go out at night they didn't even walk around the neighborhood they didn't, you know, they just, just normal things that kids would do or young people would do. They didn't do because of this legendary figure that was out there. So lo and behold, in like 2001, the police in Liverpool took into custody this six and a half foot tall black man named Aiken Wally Arobi Aiki, who oh. identified himself as Purple Aiki. And after the arrest, 125 men, now middle-aged, came forward to identify him as the man who had accosted them when they were kids. Wow. So this bizarre figure that people thought was in children's imagination turned out to be something very real. So it was all this sort of perception and, you know, adults not believing what the kids were saying and there not being any real sort of proof of anything so the story of Candyman actually has this very incredible basis in truth, and you know, not just based in the Bloody Mary story, but based in this very real urban legend of uh, Aiken Wally and Roby Aiken in Liverpool. It's a very interesting story. But, uh, yeah, but, but uh, of all the sort of paranormal games that kids play, there's nothing that is more just disturbing than the Ouija board. And I've had my own experiences with this. The only time I ever used a Ouija board was a few months after my dad died. This was when I was 18 years old. And it was very strange. I was at a friend's house, and they someone brought one over, and they were playing around with it. And I didn't want to play with it. I was kind of skeptical, you know, not skeptical, but kind of afraid of it. And they couldn't get anything to happen, so they... Um, you know, they they asked if my dad was there because he had just died. And uh, it said yes. And it, they asked, uh, do you have anything to tell Ursula? And it spelled out, I love you, Annie. Now, my mm-hmm. first name is really Anne. That's my given really? name. I started going by my middle name, which is Ursula, when I was a little girl. These girls that were at this my friend's house 
had absolutely no idea that Anne was my first name. Really? I mean, I never mentioned it. I never used it. I never wrote it. Nothing. And certainly not Annie. And uh, wow. that totally freaked me out. And then they said, um, they asked a few more questions, and it said, like, I miss you, Annie. Tell Mom I love her, things like that. And then it got quiet. And then they asked if anyone else was there, and it spelled out, I'm here too, Annabelle, which is what my dad's twin brother used to call me when I was a little girl. Oh, and he oh, had geez. died in a freak accident six months before my dad. And that was enough for me. It was <laughs> Ouija board. But, you know, the thing about the Ouija board is, you know, people that um, are fearful of them say that, you know, one of two things that these are not the spirits of our loved ones talking. You know, that's the last thing it is. That it's either, you know, demons or evil spirits trying to convince us that their loved ones are speaking to them so they can control us, get us to use the Ouija board now. And that's even scarier. Exactly. And the other thing people think is that it's just, um, there's something that's tap, it's tapping into our unconscious mind. And a lot of the stories that you hear, you know, a lot of, you know, psychologists that don't believe in the paranormal even believe that, that it sort of unleashes all of the stuff. And that's, that's what, you know, skeptics believe happened during the case of Robbie Doe, who was the inspiration for the, the uh, exorcist, the, the, the true story behind that, that Robbie Doe was taught to use a Ouija board by his grandmother, who was a spiritualist, and that that sort of opened up you know, kind of a can of worms or whatever, and uh, all of these sort of repressed emotions and feelings came out of him, and all these this, you know, phenomena and violence happened because of it. So, uh, well, you know, most people will advise you against the use of the Ouija board, you know, especially, yeah. interestingly enough, people that don't even believe in the paranormal, believing that it's really a powerful tool for, tool for tapping into our psyches or our subconscious. Uh, it's it's a fine line I don't want to go on. <laughs> <laughs> a, uh, you were telling us, uh, you started telling a story about a kid with a Ouija board. Um, a, li- hmm. a little bit before we got on to the guy from Liverpool. I'm trying to think which one I was going to tell. There's I'll tell you one, the, <laughs> one of the, um, oh yeah. <laughs> the, uh, no! <laughs> the story that I heard before, um, my own story with the Ouija board it was a story that happened to a friend of mine when um, she was in eighth grade. And uh, she was uh, over at her friend's house staying overnight. And they, the two of them and uh, the mom and two other people living in the house were playing with the Ouija board. And not, absolutely nothing happened, nothing. So they all went to bed. And in the middle of the night, my friend woke up and there was, sat straight up in bed and there was a little man about two feet tall standing in the doorway of a room dressed in a three-piece suit with cloven hooves instead of feet and she started to pray and she started to say the our father and then she said you know, she was from this very christian background she said get out in the name of jesus christ and this little guy threw his head back and laughed and went running off down the hallway. Well, she, you know, spent a very fitful night after that, ended up falling back to sleep, you know, sometime later. And in the morning, of course, thought it was a dream. And then at the breakfast table, found out that all four other people in the house had the exact same experience in the middle of the night of seeing this little man in the doorway of their room. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you had me a cl- uh, cloven hooves. I, yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, there goes sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was nice sleeping while I had a chance. <laughs> and this is just the first of uh of October. So yeah. Uh, uh, so so you're definitely not a children's author <laughs> <laughs> no it's funny the only children's book i wrote was uh, creepy chicago and i wrote it specifically because i was horrified because i would go to book signings and lectures and stuff and there'd be all these kids that had my other books to sign and these are i mean these are gruesome books about you know the history of chicago and like hundreds of people that were killed or died and 
and the terrible things that happen. And, you know, things like the E2 nightclub disaster and, you know, stuff like that. You know, the John Wayne Casey murders and things. And uh, I was, yeah, right. And I was <laughs> horrified. And these are like middle school kids that are reading these books. So I decided to write a book, you know, just for kids that wouldn't have all these gruesome stories. So now they just buy both, you know, they buy all of them. So they buy the kids' <laughs> book and they buy the other ones. So Devo- the devoted kids fans. Lo- yeah, the kids love mm-hmm. this stuff. So what kind of letters are, we're running out of time, but I have to ask, what kind of, what are these letters saying from parents? I mean, you know. Yeah, there should be a warning on this book that this book is not for children. And like I said, the cover is misleading. It looks like a children's book. The title sounds like a children's book. This book is not for children. Do you know that there are other books with this title that are children's books? It's very misleading. But if you go to the bookstore, I'm guessing this isn't in, <laughs> you know, the kids section, you know. <laughs> no. It's right next. <laughs> the to, it's books. between Amityville Horror and, you know, like. <laughs> the Mothman Prophecy. The, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I just, <laughs> Oh, look, oh, a look. kid's book. It's, <laughs> it's colorful. Yeah, pick you know, up a right? couple copies of the Mothman Prophecies for the kids. Right next yeah. to Wake Up, You're Dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do oh. want to let you know we have all of your books linked up to our website. Thank uh, you. Whispersradio.com. I'm pretty sure they're all, uh, yeah, website's there. I'm pretty sure that's all of your books. It's all the ones that Amazon gave me, so I took them all. So uh, All the Chicago books. Uh, I, 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 Chicago is an interesting city anyway, so. For the Resurrection Mary was always one of my favorite stories. Oh, yeah. Um, we do a whole tour is based around the Resurrection Mary store, and we visit the houses she was believed to have lived in, the funeral home where she was supposedly laid out. It's like a six-hour tour, and it's very popular. People absolutely love that story. I asked always the picture with the where the bars of the, of right? the graveyard are like, uh, I mean, like crunched, you know, that was always one of my favorite pictures ever, par- uh, ghost kind of pictures. So. Yeah, great, great photo. Yeah. Well, I definitely, I want this book. <laughs> <laughs> you I'm, need to talk I'm, to your mom first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if my mommy will let me buy it, <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> uh, definitely, uh, thank you so much for uh, being on the show with us. Uh, we're, you're, you're coming back if you if can you, put up with us. If you want to. Yeah, I'd love to. If you can it's put great. up with us for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> this fun. is fun. Thanks. Uh, like I said, all your books are linked up to our site, and uh, you'll be hearing back for us. Thank you very much for, for sharing your stories with us. Thank you. You guys Thanks. have a great night. Right, and thank ya. you for taking sleep away from us <laughs> for a long time. We'll bring you back near the end of our, <laughs> our I guess, our lives. You can't live without sleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be delusional. Right. See you, Ursula. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Bye. Are you creeped out, Nikki? Oh, you know, I was wondering where she was going with that story. I'm like, okay, yeah, they're taking pictures. Oh, you're gonna say, oh, and they took a picture of this, you know, person in the in a window or something. And then when she said, well, and the picture was taken several feet above their bed, That's she just had crazy. me. That's crazy. Yeah. I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait a second. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, okay, somebody broke into the room, or you know, listen, the, I heard it. Right, I heard it, and then as my brain started to understand what she said, I started feeling my goose. <laughs> like it was, it was a delay. It was great, Nikki. Who yeah, we got next week? We've got Sean B. Uh, always popular to have on here. He's we're got so for, many stories. Well, we're gonna have him for an hour and a half. Uh, we're gonna just talk. I just took everything you can get creepy. We just want to like creep everybody out. And so. our dear sweet Lola will be back. Yeah, we'll be talking about her and uh, Barb's gonna be bringing in. A record, uh, the recorder, recording, yeah. and hopefully Lolo will have an experience. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, we need yeah. the Fabio here one day, just to go. Yeah. Yeah. Can you get get that hooked yeah. up first, Biff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, right, can you tell Lolo where those drops are? We need those drops. <laughs> we can just pretend he's here, right, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Until next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Wait, wait, hey, Bill, are you ready for Lola to have her experience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Don't be afraid. Only believe.